Welcome to the Game the Flayers podcast, episode 27. My name is John, and I am joined by co-host Ryan. Hey, everybody. Here at the Game the Flayers podcast, we like to talk about games we're currently playing, games we recently picked up, and the Inflation Deflation Challenge. This week was pretty good, actually. I uh, truly enjoyed the game that we played for our Inflation Deflation. It was quite good. Quite good. Yeah. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But first off, let's go ahead and start off. John, what you pick up this week, man? So, uh, surprisingly, I was able to actually go out and get some gaming stuff this week. Um, it's been hectic since about February. I've been moving into a new house, doing a whole bunch of housework and such. Uh, really haven't had the opportunity to go out and actually do any sort of uh, gaming hunting. Uh, but we happened to go to a bookstore, and they had a couple of uh, old strategy guides. So, I picked up the uh, Sub-Zero official uh, game strategy guide for Mythologies which uh, is probably one of the worst games ever created in the Mortal Kombat franchise. Um, outside of, uh, I can't remember the other one on PS1, there's, a, there's one that's worse. Um, so there's that, and then I also picked up a strategy guide for The Bouncer. If you have not played The Bouncer on PS2, it is a Square Soft game. I don't believe they actually had a Square Enix version come out. Uh, it was during the PS2 era, and uh, it's actually a pretty cool... Um, 3D like beat em up in a sense and uh, it's been a long time since I played that game but the strategy guy just brought back tons of old memories so uh, I had to pick it up both were probably five dollars a pop roughly in that area and yeah I mean that, that's what I got man what did you end up picking up so this last week uh, a few really awesome things I picked up I picked up my switch I played some cave blazers of course but I also went on there and I bought katana zero which is an awesome new indie title. Uh, it reminds me of kind of like a side-scrolling Hotline Miami, real fast-paced, awesome music, uh, visually striking, action-packed game. It's it's pretty cool. I'm digging it. I haven't played a whole lot of it so far, but I'm hoping to get all the way through this one like I did The Messenger. And I think there's some Messenger DLC on the way soon. I'll have to look at that again. And then I also picked up Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age for Switch. And I'm super pumped for this. I still have my PS2 guide for it. So, hey, guides respect guides. Yeah, so, yeah for sure. Hey, a uh, quick question on that. On uh, 12 for the Nintendo Switch, did they make any adjustments from the PS4 version? I, I heard something yeah, that things were are. changed. So they... And I never made it very far through it the first time, but there actually there's an article on Twinfinite. Uh, the Switch is the best place to play Final Fantasy XII, so it has a couple of different uh, updates. Uh, anybody who doesn't know Zodiac Age is like kind of like the real deal uncut version that we didn't get here in America originally. So that's one of the things that makes it more than the original out the gate and i was told that they like or at least I, I think i heard that they made some adjustments like the battle system on the nintendo switch version versus what's on the ps4 well they gave you the ability to uh change your class for your characters so you can you can have uh multiple classes and you can change the classes which is something that's different than the ps4 i don't exactly know what that really means for me yet all i did i turned it on last night after i got it installed i watched the pretty cutscenes for the first you know seemed like 20 minutes and then i was about ready to pass out by the time it was like hey this is how you move you so know i forgot about how long like pushing that car at the beginning of final fantasy 15 was nice but i forget how long it's been since it's like oh wait i just sit here and don't do anything for a while speaking of final San fantasy 15 man um, I just heard that they had chopped a while back. So part of the um, the DLC that they ended up canceling was like an alternate ending for the game. So pissed. Like I, I was really hoping to have like that DLC come out and see like what they kind of come up with. And to hear that there was a potential alternate ending is just upsetting in a, in a sense. So I'm, I'm kind of angry at the uh, Square team right now. Well, I mean, considering it was a alternate game to begin with by not being versus 13, I mean, yeah, there's and, already and been so years. many changes and cancels and rearrangements of whatever the story might have been. Like, who knows by now? Yeah, I mean, we might get a DLC in 10 years uh, at this rate. Um, 
Yeah, so is that safe to say that that's what you're going to be currently playing is Final Fantasy XII? Well, it's kind of interesting. I had heard this idea on another podcast a few weeks ago. I can't remember if I brought it up. Well, I've told a bunch of people about it. What's the name of the podcast? Oh, it's the uh, Dad and Sons podcast. Oh, okay. But I heard about it on there, and then I looked it up, and I saw like a whole subreddit thread about this idea. But you could pull the joystick, the Joy Cons off of your Switch, and then you can put your Switch on like the book holder part, and you could just play games while you're on the treadmill. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I gonna, saw that too. Did, yeah, I think s- you did bring it up last yeah, week. I, yeah, but I'm gonna start doing that. And I've been waiting. I was hunting around. I listened to a whole podcast on uh, Retro Knots. Was really good with uh, Dragon Quest Eleven, which I haven't played any of the Dragon Quest games except for I like the Dragon uh, Dragon Warrior Monsters games. They were on uh, Game Boy Color and the one on the DS. I played both of those and liked those. They were like kind of pseudo Pokemon, but in the Dragon Quest world. But anyways, I looked at those and I looked at um, a couple other games, Octopath Traveler. And I was trying to find something that I could play on the treadmill that would be not something that I had to be super accurate with. Like nothing like people say like, oh, I'll run around and explore in Zelda or, you know play an easy level in Mario, something that doesn't require a lot of finesse with the platforming. So I figured this was like the perfect game because you don't actually have to control any of the combat. You just have to set the stuff up in the menus to work out and then watch it play out and just kind of move around. I was like, that would be interesting. And also it's like, it's a good long game that if I play this and I actually want to get through it, I think it'll keep me running for a while so i'm i'm gonna look into that and we'll weigh in on that we'll we'll have like a new we can make a whole new thing we'll see how how far i can run and how far i can play and we'll see like how many miles i can rack up playing this game yeah i might have to join you man i've kind of uh increased my belly size here recently so that might be a good idea for me to play some salt and sanctuary while you know, hanging on the treadmill. That's going to be way too hard. Oh, dude. It's going to be way too hard. I'm up hard. for the challenge. I can't stop running until I kill a boss. That, that's what it is. You, you don't think that'd be good? Dude, there's no way you can play Salt and Sanctuary on a treadmill. I uh, Challenge accepted. All right. Give it a All shot. Right. Give challenge it a shot. accepted. I guess it's weird for me to think about playing it on a treadmill because I played it on Vita. Yeah. So that's like, I'm just thinking there how I played it, like trying to run with a Vita. But no, I guess if you did the Switch thing, you might be able to get it to work. Might be able to. I don't think so, man. It but just we'll depends see. on how much you have to read. I don't think there's a lot of reading going on in that game. You might be okay. I might be okay. Yeah. So I actually started, um, I guess we can segue into some of our currently playing. Um, so obviously I've got Birth by Sleep still on the back burner. Just haven't had a chance to sit back. I mean, I literally just unloaded my video game collection to the room. So if you haven't uh, checked out our Instagram and maybe our Facebook page, um, I've actually got before and after. So you can see just how beautiful it looks when it fills out and compared to the empty shelving that I had, it's, it's actually a pretty cool photo. So that's on our Instagram page. I think it's at game deflators or at game deflators podcast. Um, so salt and sanctuary, I played a little bit of it. And by a little bit of it, I mean, I played probably enough to create my character kill off one monster and then i fell asleep did you get a chance to check out any of the like the tree have you seen the tree yet dude i was i was actually i don't even know how i didn't die at that point in time i was actually playing asleep at that moment killed a couple monsters woke up looked at the screen and saw that i had gotten a couple monsters and lost some hp and then i just put my switch what kind in of sleep class mode. did you pick um i picked a paladin class actually figured a nice little uh mix of fighting and magic would be pretty cool so we'll see how that goes yeah i can't remember the name of the class that i picked but it's got a whip and a crossbow uh hunter probably something like yeah, I that think it was a hunter class was i was looking at that one too so i was in between that a fighter and a paladin and ultimately i went with paladin because i do like and in fact if you were to uh keep i don't think we've had any like dark souls or anything like that since you and i have been doing a podcast but uh when i play dark souls games or any soul based type game 
I've always enjoyed having a lot of magic integrated with my character. So Dark Souls 3, for example, I actually went straight mage the entire way through. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And I actually, I think I went fighter in Demon Souls and Dark Souls. And in Dark Souls 2, I went through a hybrid of magic and fighting. So wanted to do the whole hybrid thing going into Salts and Sanctuary, and we'll see how it pays off. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a super fun game. I had a good time with it. It's pretty hard. And I don't get into those Soulsborne games as much. Just they're not really for me. And uh, I don't know. It it was good. You'll definitely like it. You'll definitely like it. I thought it was a great game, but it was just not really my cup of tea. So I didn't play it for too long. Well, we'll, we'll see, man. It's going to be my while I'm laying there trying to go to sleep type of game. That's exactly what happened to me, too. And then I kept going to sleep instead of playing. Yeah, so that's probably what's going to happen to me, too. So <laughs> we'll see how it all goes, man. So uh, you're obviously going to start playing Final Fantasy XII, but are there any other games that you were like, hardcore like trying to beat right now um i'm still trying to get my way through uh zone of the enders fist of mars on gba oh that reminds me i gotta do sukkoden 2 still yeah so i'm still playing at that um and then i still need to go back and do the first one for ps2 zone of the enders and then i need to do zone of the enders second runner but cumulatively it shouldn't take me more than like Probably 20 hours or 30 hours to beat all three of these games. Do you have the uh, PS3 HD versions? Yeah. Of, okay, that's what I figured. Yeah. I think I've got them on PS2. I don't believe I have the HD version. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's totally doable because I really want to get through those before uh, Demon X Machina comes out on Switch because I had so much fun with that demo that I need a, I need to look up and see what the, the launch date was that. I think it just says sometime in 2019 right now. So I don't really have like an end game plan, but I think it would be fun to try to wrap up my new games resolutions by the time we get around to that launching so that I can segue right in there. Cause I picked up Zodiac age so that I could have something to do this whole crazy treadmill scheme of mine. But other than that, like I just don't have anything really on my horizons right now that I'm really looking forward to. I go on my Switch and I throw stuff on my wish list, but it's nothing that I'm really banging down the door to buy for $60. Yeah, and that's, the, that's where I've been too, man. And uh, we can definitely go into our new section here in a minute. Um, I just haven't seen anything that really catches my eye. It's like, I have to have this game and I've got to buy it right now. Sekido was probably the only one. Maybe uh, Ghost of... Uh, Tsushima, when it's uh, you know announced like the actual release date, that's a game that I really want to buy. But other than that, I haven't seen anything that like really just catches my attention. Says you got to buy me day one. Um, that being said, uh, it, the last episode we talked about GameStop and their return policy for or not return policy that they're doing, but kind of a, a test policy in a sense, where with Days Gone in particular, if you did not like the game or it was just garbage in the first like 48 hours they would allow you to return a brand new game open which is very much against any store policy you go to and you could bring it in for full store credit which is pretty much unheard of most times if you buy a game brand new at GameStop and you come in and say I didn't like it you don't get a return and you don't get any credit as far as a full credit they're just like yeah here's $35 that's what we're buying it for like that's what they do so this was very much unheard of and Given some of the recent negative reviews, um, now not to say the game's terrible from what we've seen, but given some of the recent negative reviews, it makes me wonder if they knew something and that's why they implemented that policy. Well, I think that there was um, a lot of backlash this year. A lot of games that people have really been looking forward to just kind of aren't meeting the standards that we're really looking for in like a modern full price game. I don't know about too much this game, it never really interested me looking at any of the E3 footage the last couple of years. I was always just kind of like, eh, another zombie game. It, it kind of felt like, um, what is it, Dead Island in a sense? Like a yeah. Dead Island mixed with Sons of Anarchy type of thing? Yeah, basically. And it was like, eh, dude, do I really care? Like out of all the PS4 exclusives announced in the last few years, that was honestly the one where I just wasn't really looking forward to it. Well, I mean, I zombies are so overdone. Open world survival games are so overdone. It's just two things that everybody's done before, 
presented in a new way. And I think that some of the things that are in there look I, pretty cool. I'd honestly argue it's not even presented in a new way. I, I mean, it, it really looks like a standard zombie survival game. It just so happens to be open world and a PS4 exclusive. Well, I mean, some of the things that they have in it look kind of interesting. Like, I remember I was so excited for Resident Evil 5, and the I remember the spread. There was like a, a headline or a tagline somebody had written that was like, you can't believe how many enemies they can fit on screen at once. And it was like terrifying. And then you look at this game and you see the big giant hordes in there. Like, that's pretty cool. Like, some of the things that they did in the game are interesting. But my biggest thing that I've heard is that it just takes a while to start up. And we could talk about that if you want. Because I know there's a lot of people out there that are not into the idea of, oh, this game gets good at like 10 hours in. Or just wait out the first five hours and then it starts to get good. It's like some people don't want to give a TV show the first three episodes to see if it's worth it. If you watch the first episode and you're not that into it, you're just like, no, it's not for me. You bring up a great point, man. Like my mom, for example, not too long ago, had not seen any episodes of Game of Thrones. And she saw the first episode and said, eh, it's all right. I'm like, just, you know, you gotta, you gotta watch it a few episodes and it really kicks up a notch. Next thing you know, she tells me three days later, she's on season five. So it's, you know, it could very well be that type of situation with this game. The one article that I would reference, I think you've got it pulled up. The guy was like, yeah, I'm 20 hours in and it's just ugly. Like, it's just not that great of a game 20 hours in. Now, if you're 20 hours in and it's still bad, yeah, that's one guy, but if it's pretty much across the board, like, yeah, it just isn't a fantastic game, then it's not a good game. Well, I mean, I've heard people say that once you get through the first bit, it starts to get more interesting, but then it just kind of slogs itself through. I mean, I don't know. Open world games were super fun for a long time, and now it's just not something... I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting cynical, because there's just so many games and genres that I kind of avoid now, because it's not really new or it's not something i want to do like i'm always drawn more to you know hit indie games or you know anything that's like a new interesting roguelike thing like uh, those attract me way more than another mario or another new rpg or you know whatever it's just not the once you've been there and once you've done it it's like the ubisoft thing you know how many towers and how many games can you climb to reveal new parts of the map before it's like i've been there i've done that i get it you know i mean they even you had to climb towers in zelda well i'm i'm over here like counting assassin's creed on my shelf i think there's like 10 so times that by whatever amount of towers in each game on average that's a and lot then of towers. The far cries oh my god yeah yeah and then the far cries i don't have any of those actually uh good point on the indie games by the way so i've also found myself going towards those shorter like graphically beautiful and good gameplay but not something like super overdone like an open world game i've just found a lot of enjoyment in those types of games as of late and totally see your point and um you know those games while they do cost money to develop it doesn't cost nearly as much time well i mean it costs time because you got a smaller team obviously it's not like a team that made days gone but you know, the amount of money getting pumped into one of those indie titles, if you had a larger team doing it and being able to pump it out quicker with less of a budget, you know, it makes you wonder, is the route, you know, in the next few years going to be more indie game related versus AAA titles like A Day's Gone? Well, and less crunch. I mean, there's so many articles coming out these days. We just had another thing come out with um, what was it? Mortal Kombat 11 talking about all the crunch we got all the crunch with red dead we've heard about all this crunch and all these people that are killing themselves working you know 70 to 100 hours a week and it's just brutal and they get no respect they don't get you know anywhere near the praise and anything that they deserve because the bosses step in and then they lay off hundreds of people and you know even when that's not the case even when they're not treated you know that poorly like uh, how much crunch did he put in for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate? You know? Yeah. And you know what? 
it kind of makes you wonder if a reason we have so many of these bugs in games and like issues that need to be fixed up half the time on, on release, if that's actually done on purpose by some of these developers to keep their job a little longer in between titles and such too. Well, I mean, no, what it, it comes, then they're employed. Well, no, they what fork- it comes down to is that, hey, we don't have enough time to make this game. Make as much of it as you can, as best as you can, while you're tired and unable to have any free time to even think about anything but doing this. Just do this as much and as long as we can make you, as quickly as you can, and then we'll fix it in post. And then you're fired. Yeah, yeah. Or, hey, you know all those things that you did really well? Do this other game instead. And once you fuck up a couple of those, then we'll shut you down. I mean, I've already been hearing rumors and stirrings about how um, Dragon Age is going to have some of this bullshit too, some of this live experience stuff and some of this, you know, microtransaction bullshit. Like the market has been so saturated that games like Anthem, Anthem had the same kind of thing. Like I think Anthem is what inspired the days gone. Hey, we'll give you a couple days to check this out. And if you don't like it, bring it back. Like well, how I many people I wouldn't even did say that it with was, Anthem when I it was killing e- their consoles? I wouldn't even say it was the starting of Anthem. I mean, you look at Fallout 76, which was just before that. And then you've got, um, what's that game? That I almost opened? forgot about Fallout 76 with all the bad uh-huh. news Anthem's had. It almost made me forgot, honestly. Yeah, exactly. What's the other game that came out a few years ago as well? It was uh, the one where it's like an open world, not open world, like you get to go to different planets and Mass such. Effect Andromeda? No, 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 no. Different planets as in like you can cultivate those worlds. Oh, oh, um, yeah. The one, it's not. Like infinite, it's infinite not reality. It's in, yeah. Hold on, I'll look it up. Uh, whoever, whoever's listening out of our like 30 or 40 people that actually uh, download the podcast and, and listen to it on YouTube and such, um, they'll probably know right off the bat. Um, but yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where you uh, you go to different planets, you cultivate them, and um, it's like infinite types of planets, so it's always like generating new stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up. I know exactly what you're talking about. I now just can't remember the freaking name of it. Yeah, I can't either. It's like six bucks, I think. No, it went up in price recently. I think it's sitting at about twenty now. God, we are terrible at this. We Sorry, really folks. are. Well, I mean, I just kind of threw it on a whim, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, but yeah, no man, man's sky, no man's sky, no there you man's go. sky. That's the one. That's supposed to be way better. And that's well, now the thing. It is, yeah, to, well, that's the thing that people are counting on is like, how can we get one of those games that everybody buys, and then we just make it better later? And not worry about it. Well, the problem with that is that once you do that enough, people get salty and people don't want to do that shit anymore. So it's like, if you're not going to support these games, like, so this is the whole thing going on with Anthem well, dude, right now. That, that point, man, like, why would I spend $60 on a game brand new? And we've had this conversation before of why I always buy games used in like a year after the fact. It's I'm not going to pay $60 to have a buggy ass game and then not be able to enjoy it to its fullest when in six months to a year, I can pick it up for 30 to $20. And with extra content, with basically. Extra, yeah, with extra content included, like Horizon Zero Dawn. I don't know how many bugs were in that game, but it was like 15 bucks or something that I paid to get all the DLC, a full game, no bugs, or at least major bugs in the title, because well, it been out for I'm not even talking year. about DLC or bugs. I'm talking about like a full added game. features. Like, yeah. like not selling you the complete game versus... Yeah, buying the game and all the patches are in and now it's the complete version of itself for less money. Yeah, exactly. Like I don't want to spend $60 given the history of No Man's Sky, Bethesda with their Fallout 76, Anthem, now Days Gone. Now I don't know how bad Days Gone is because I haven't had a chance to play it yet. But, you know, all these games that continually come out with, you know, poor initial, you know, reactions from both critics and players... Why would I spend that type of money on a game if it's going to be bad to begin with? Like, I will wait a few weeks before I do that. So, yeah, that's pretty much where I'd be on that end, dude. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely not the best time for big AAA publishers kind of throwing around their weight and their exclusives or, you know, their big, long-waiting, money-making titles. It, this, this is going to be an interesting year to reflect back on and I want to see what else comes out. Like I can't believe that 
Fallout 76. That was last year a little bit too, wasn't it? Like late 2018, I late think. Late 2018, yeah. So it's like that debacle. Actually, and it might have been early 2019. I don't even know anymore. But anyways, like that's what I'm saying. These scandals with these games have been so big and so ongoing. It's like not just like, oh, you heard about it and then you never hear about it again. But it's like it just keeps coming up. So I'm interested to see what else winds up doing that this year. Like I wouldn't be surprised if we had another couple of games that just kind of are like, oh, wow, this is not at all what I was expecting. Well, Agony, uh, dude, I probably brought up Agony like five or six times in different episodes. That's a game that I truly was looking forward to and was 100% ready to go to the store and buy it. And I was like, you know, let me just look at a review or a few reviews and see, you know, what's going on with this game beforehand because I don't want to spend the money and ends up being trash. Ended up having extremely bad reviews. They said it was extremely buggy. Graphics were horrible. The voice acting was bad. This was a game that I was looking forward to for months on end and just could not stop talking about only to see it just come out with just as bad. Just wasn't a good game. So it'll be interesting to see this year what happens to your point. But also we're in the midst of, you know, the next generation of console coming up too. So it's how much are we going to get in terms of really good games at the end of this year that are probably going to be released in the next console anyways. Well, I mean, you always get those games that are like uh, Twilight Princess that's dual console. You know, you get those like launches that kind of teeter on the edge. And some of those games are actually really good because it's like once you get this late in the console's life cycle, you know the game. You know how to work all the little things into the game. Like making that game is way easier than it was to make the first game. Yeah, no, very true, man. So uh, I'm still interested, though, to see, you know, do we end up with a pushback on titles that were supposed to come out and end up getting pushed to new console, or do we get a rushed product because they just want to pop it out on a PS4 and are working on a PS5 version right now? You know, I, I just wonder how much of that is going to come into play, and, you know, are we going to get a worse product towards the end of the console life cycle when the focus might be on hey, we're going to sell games that, I'm not saying this is, you know, accurate, but say they boost up games to be 70 bucks a pop brand new. Like, we can sell X amount of games at $70 a piece as a remastered 8K compatible game on well, the PS5. Well, you say boost up, but I mean, games used to be $100. Well, I don't know if it was, was it 100 bucks? Oh, yeah. They, I've heard people talk about, like, new games coming out. No, like honest to god like they were marketed for that much you know what you're right now i think about it back in the early 90s picking up nintendo games in a 60 to 70 dollar range there was no set figure for games until like ps2 rolled out for 50 ps1 i think ps1 was was 50 ps1 had like i think it was 50 dollar games yeah 49.99 because i remember the jump to 60 and i was like yeah. All right, well, this totally seems worth it. The fact that we've had it from the entire era of the PS3 and the PS4 is kind of crazy when you think about it being that long at the $60 price range. Yeah. And the cost of development has gone up. So I I wouldn't be shocked if they started to increase the cost of or price of games when they come out new. Well, that's but the thing. That's, that, that's where microtransactions well, come in now. But that's the thing that they say with all that. And uh, I know I've talked to James extensively. And I've talked to uh, another friend who was in game design. It took some in college and stuff. And it was just, it was something that I always used to think. But after watching Jimquisition, and uh, shout out to Jim Sterling. His videos are awesome. If you want to know about this kind of stuff, he covers all this kind of stuff that we've been talking about here for like the last, I don't know, 15 minutes. You know, what's going on in the triple A uh, gaming industry, where all these... uh, you know, trends are going. He talks about all that stuff a lot. I get a lot of good info from him. But it just doesn't... And I've talked about it before, referencing him before too. It's It just doesn't pan out. Like, you can't say that we're breaking sales records and we're the most profitable we've ever been and then complain about how you can't make enough money selling your games. Well, And, that- and then you're selling games that aren't finished and aren't done like... Just make games that are good. Like indie game developers make games that are good. And I'm sure that they probably use like a 
pretty narrow budget. Like, I'm pretty sure they don't have a whole lot of wiggle room and they may have to crunch because it's, you know, they're focusing on making something that they really want to make. But, you know, you can make good games and sell them for a certain amount of money and make profit and and do it. Like, that's what making games is. That's what doing your job is. Like, you go to work and you do your job. These game executives go to work, they promise the world, and then they force everybody to work insane just to push it out and reap all the rewards for the stockholders. Yeah, exactly, man. And so I actually was reading an article recently from Yahoo on their financial side of things, and it was talking about the outlook of games from 2019 to I think it was 2023. And it was saying that one of the the biggest barriers that they're seeing in terms of growth in the gaming market is really just the cost of game development. Like that's going to be one of the biggest barriers coming forward um, for all the major players and and those key players being Activision, EA, Microsoft, Nintendo, uh, PlayStation or Sony, obviously, and then uh, Tencent uh, is one of those bigger players. But, you know, one of the things that they've been doing, and, and that's the thing, it's such a big competitive landscape overall. Uh, between mobile gaming, uh, PC gaming, console gaming, you have Stadia game, coming up. Yeah, the, the uh, streaming services that are that are in existence today. So you know it's a huge competitive landscape already, um, and you know you got to think about ways that they're going to make money. And one of those ways is obviously through the pushing of esports, which is already huge to begin with. But you're now seeing it on things like I was actually watching ABC. Um, in my hotel room a few weeks back and it it was just like, it was Dota just on TV randomly being played on a national televised uh, syndicate. So, um, you know, I think that's going to be one of those ways in the next few years, like that's probably where we're going to see a big push is towards a lot of competitive gaming and trying to increase revenues from, you know, the advertising dollars that are coming through uh, TV promotional deals similar to what you have with sports and like the NFL and, and NBA. So I can see that being like the major push. And obviously the microtransactions are going to be there. But I think some companies are now seeing like the negativity that spurn from those microtransactions. Uh, EA recently, I think with their new Star Wars game, they were like, there's no microtransactions. They're the ones who caused the microtransaction problem. Yeah, exactly. They're so- the ones who Star Wars Battlefronted. Twice. And they lost tons of money. So I think them seeing like the error in their ways on that, they're like, we can't keep doing this. But if we go to competitive way, which tournaments and such have always been here. I remember as a in like middle school and high school having just straight up, hey, we're going to pay like five bucks to do a tournament type of thing. Like everybody pulling their money and we're going to play and whoever gets first and second takes it. And games like Dota have huge microtransactions like you can buy armor sets and stuff for a ton of money and all it is is cosmetic you don't win more but isn't a game free to begin with though? oh it's totally free yeah exactly you literally don't have to buy anything you can play all the heroes in dota it's not even like league where you start off and you only have certain heroes that are in like the base pool and then you have like a rotating pool of heroes each week that are available for free and then you can save up your in-game points to buy them or buy them worth real-world money. Exactly, and you have the ability to... But that also to, has the rune system that you can yeah. use. But you also have the ability... Uh, there's you and your phone again, man. But you obviously have the ability in a game like um, you know, Dota or uh, any other free game for that, for that matter to be able to purchase using in-game currency that you get from playing. Um, the thing with EA is, yeah, we've got microtransactions on a game that you just paid a boatload of money for. Now we're going to have you pay more money to do microtransactions. That's probably where the issue really lies. And I don't know if we've ever brought it up before, but I don't have an issue with microtransactions as long as it's cosmetic based and it doesn't have a major impact on the game itself. And when it comes to a free game like a or a Legends, having those microtransactions is obviously a way to stimulate their growth and their revenue, which makes sense, along with advertising and all that good stuff. A game like Battlefront 2 already has revenue coming in from the game sales. So while it's cool to have microtransactions, anything that is going to affect your overall performance in the game and gameplay shouldn't exist. 
Well, and it's interesting, too, because, like, the player bases for these games, like, Dota 2 is, I think, the biggest eSport in the world. Like, I watch, I've been watching Dota 2 competitively for three, four years now, and I've only played, like, two or three games. I know I've talked about that before, and actually, the uh, MDL Disneyland Paris Major is starting up on uh, May 4th. That's another million dollar prize pool major to see who else can push for the TI run this year. And when you want to get into like motivation for playing games, these are the games, these free to play games like Dota and League. Like, yeah, they want you to dump your time into it. And it is a grind, but it's not a grind for artificial like, oh, well, you know, you want your better loot and stuff, well, you got to grind for it and grind for it. Wouldn't it be easier just to pay a little bit of money? You know, that's what they're looking for. And what do you ever get out of that? Like, what is anybody ever really going to get out of Anthem? Whereas people who play Dota on the highest levels, uh, I got a list here of the International, which is basically the Super Bowl of Dota, and their prize pool. Uh, last year's prize pool, $25 million. Yeah, that, so, that's worth playing a game and doing your little microtransactions to be able to, to get better and improve as a team. You don't you don't have that with Anthem, necessarily. Yeah, you're never going to win money playing Anthem. I mean, you could if they had tournaments and such, but it's not but as But they big. don't. They have a struggling player base right now. They're losing players because it, the, the grind is so hard the hardest difficulty levels should reward the best and most loot. Nobody wants to do that because you can get more loot running something easier three times in the same amount of time. So people who actually want to challenge themselves and try hard and actually try the hard grind, they can't get matchmaking. They can't do it with a full team of people because not enough people are willing to play their stupid game and just get furious and pay them. If they actually want to grind it out, they're grinding it out on the easiest, cheesiest way that they can. Yeah, And, and it's I so bad that they've actually stopped production on their... Oh, I forget what they call it. There's a turn... Like their roadmap. They had a roadmap for all the features that they were working on adding and... It's so bad right now that they're stopped working on anything new to add to this game that mm -hmm. hasn't even been out for, like, what, three months even? Something like that. And, it, dude, that's right where I am with the whole idea of not buying a game new. If I would have bought Anthem brand new and three months down the road you were going to tell me there's going to be no support coming out for it in the next few months and they've ceased all, you know, production of additional features, I'd be pissed. So the fact that... Three months down the road, a game that I was kind of looking at as, you know, potentially something I wanted to play, you're now telling me they're not going to keep supporting that down the road? Why in the hell would I purchase it now? And what happens to all the people who paid $60 and then already bought the season pass and already paid a bunch of money for microtransactions? Well, the next game that comes out by EA, they're not going to support. But the thing is, it doesn't even matter. Um, I hate to keep doing this because, you know, I should talk about stuff that isn't just other people's podcasts. Jim Sterling put out a video a couple weeks ago talking about the tax shelters that they use in these video game industries and references EA specifically. They paid no taxes last year. They got a refund. We paid for them to not put any taxes into the U.S. economy. Like they have a basement that nobody works at in a country in Europe set as their headquarters. Say they don't have to pay taxes here. And we subsidize them trying to microtransaction us to death. Well, that does it. Definitely don't support EA now. So, no, it doesn't <laughs> matter. They're still making money off of you whether you buy their games or not. That's very true. You're paying yeah. them with every tax dollar you pay. All right. They get a little bit of it. Got to figure out some way to negate paying EA. Um, well, man, uh, speaking of not paying taxes, I think you want to talk about Blizzard cutting some funding. Oh, uh, well, I mean, that was just a tie in to like this whole uh, esports push thing. I mean, talk about games that are, you know, unsupported by their developers after a while. And this isn't new news. It was new news to you. 
but uh, Heroes of the Storm was a MOBA that Blizzard had, and they cut the development and support to that and totally killed the esports scene. So as much as I love to hear that esports are helping push the video game market, you know, it wasn't enough to keep Blizzard interested in. They weren't making enough money off of it. They had to, you know, get out there and release Diablo for mobile. <laughs> nobody wanted and another like expansion on world of warcraft or something like that's... yeah who knows it's like you see these these big giants it's the same way like they came out with um dota has a card game uh i can't even remember the name of it now well really what it comes down to man is it's just kind of further solidifying my reasoning and the way i've been gaming in that just buying used games that have been on the market for a while. I know what I'm going to get. I've seen the reviews and then supporting indie titles that are coming out at like 25 and 30 bucks a piece. Yeah, because like, all these new games are trying to be so samey. Like we didn't need a Dota version of Hearthstone the same way that we need need a Blizzard version of Dota. Well, yeah, like, and make something new. Like you're Blizzard. You change the world. You're Valve. You change the world with your games. And now all you want to do is just make your brand copy of what other people have played. That's the same days gone. Might as well be Assassin's Creed zombies, 1980. Yeah, dude. And I'm all about at this point, supporting small indie companies and their games and really getting a game at a good value. So if I pay 30 bucks and I get maybe eight to 10 hours of gameplay out of an indie game and I truly enjoy it, that's a better pill to swallow than paying $60 for Anthem, getting a buggy ass game that I'm going to put down after a month. Like that, that's just not worth it in my opinion. I mean, you're on the average at 60 bucks a month is what you're spending on something like that. I can get easily a month, maybe two out of a good indie title. If I like progress slowly enough and enjoy my time with it for 30 bucks or even or just not paying $60 for a game that you could buy a game and really like it. But if you felt like you weren't, you know, really enjoying your time. It was just an easy grind. You know, you just kind of got into the game's rhythm. It's like you could do GTA and have a ton of time on GTA just screwing around and having a ball. But at the end of the day, it's not new content. You're just doing the same thing over and over again. That's why I can't well, it's get behind... because it's a good quality game and you can enjoy your time on it versus getting a game that's poor quality and you can't enjoy your time on it. Well, what do you feel about games that just have like a simple gameplay loop, like racing games and fighting games? Like you're not really getting anything new out of those the longer you play other than getting better. And those are so competitive that it's directly about the improvement. Like that's a game that's worth putting hundreds of hours into Anthem just, it isn't. Like, I stopped playing those games years ago because I decided that playing shooters and just doing this shooter and then the next shooter and then the next shooter and just keep playing it and keep putting hours in and just keep doing the same thing. Like, there's only so many times I want to tick those same boxes in my life and not miss out on everything else. Well, I feel your question to me is a fantastic segue into our inflation deflation so as far as playing a game that has a simple loop i think our game ride and project that we played this week on the ps1 which had ride and project or ride in one and two on there um i think those types of games the ability to get better at them and the grind that's tied to it i would much rather play a single player game like ride and it is a multiplayer game it is a multiplayer game that's correct one to two players but i would rather play a game like that like a life force for example i was playing on the nes it's a great game just being able to consistently play through the level get better have all the crazy hand-eye coordination components of it seeing missiles coming your way trying to dodge and kill enemies at the same time and get better at it those are just things i truly enjoy something like a shooter where you have you know, somebody hacking their controller or cheating through the game on an online shooter or getting three hours of gameplay on Call of Duty only to have 12 year olds screaming at you about their mom or your mom, you know, on on Xbox. That to me is not enjoyable. I'd rather have the grind 
of one of these types of games. So even if it's a, a fighting game or a racing game, dude, one of my all time favorite moments as a kid during the PS one era was playing Gran Turismo and being able to get all of the licenses and drive through all of the tracks and purchase the Viper, the Dodge Viper in the game and getting the color I wanted and everything else. I put tons of hours into Gran Turismo when I was younger. Gran Turismo 1, 2, and uh, 3 as well. Oh, and 4 on the uh, on the PS3. Uh, so those are games that, while it's a continuous loop and it's the same thing, I felt that I got more out of that than a game like an Anthem or a Battlefront or well, a Call of Duty. And they're, they're paced in such a way where you feel gratified for getting what you get like most of the time. Like, I don't know if Raiden Project, I mean, I don't think it has anything that it really is going to give you for getting better at the game and getting further into it other than the satisfaction of actually, you know, getting close to beating the game. But, like, that's... That's the grind. That's what the game's meant to do. The game is meant to do that because it's it's fun and it's a decent challenge. It's not meant to just like throw bullet spongy enemies at you and just kind of be like, all right, do this until you've done it enough that will give you something maybe that you want, unless you feel like just buying a random chance to get it yourself. They like it's not artificially put that way to extract money from you. Like the the methodology or the reasoning behind it, the grind is totally different. You're doing it for you. You're not doing it because you're wanting something that has been pushed further away from you on purpose to get your money. Exactly. And that's really where I enjoy those types of games is, you know, the like a ride in and there's a satisfaction of playing a game. It's kind of like dark souls or any of the Soulsborne series. You know, you work really hard to get to that boss, and then a boss completely wipes the floor of you. So you have to continue playing and training, leveling up your character, understanding the different, you know, components of that boss that you're battling, where they're going to swing, the timing, everything to perfect that battle and make sure it actually, like, that you win. And at the end of the day, you feel amazing because you beat it. I just don't get that with games like a Call of Duty or, you know, even dota or anything like that or league of legends like there's just not you know an end result that's going to make me feel amazing about myself because at the end of the day a game like raiden if we get through the entire thing there's so much more satisfaction than racking up 30 kills in call of duty yeah it's you know it's so anyways let's uh for anybody that doesn't know what we're talking about now that we've kind of talked into it a little bit so raiden is a series it's uh Developed by uh, Seibu or Seibu Kaihatsu. I'm totally butchering that. I'm you sure. You just went to Japan. You should know this now. Like, don't you speak Japanese now? You no. spent two weeks there. No, I don't. But it's a uh, it's a shmup. It's a top down uh, ship shooter. You know the kind. You go around. You get your spread shot. You get your laser. You drop bombs, you shoot at tanks and other planes and avoid all the glowing orange dots on the screen until you can't no more and you get blowed up and then you try again. So we played we played a couple tries at the first level of each and we got into the second level of each. I mean, we didn't get that far, but we had enough to understand well, the yeah, game I mean, is. If you played a shmup, you played another yeah, shmup. Exactly. Those games are pretty much all the same in terms of um, the overall gameplay. Where I differentiate those games is the difficulty, the music that's tied to it, and the actual graphic components of it, and as well as some of the the features and the different weapons and such, and how that's different from other games. Yeah, it's it's fun, and I thought the graphics were really good uh, on both Raiden One and Raiden Two. They're about the same, really. Yeah, the weapons were interesting and unique. You've got bullets. And then a larger bullet spread, and then throw some missiles in for good measure. You've got a laser, and then a faster laser, and then a faster laser. And then you've got an uh, electric beam that like lassos and shocks things to death. Uh, a spread a couple, bomb. A couple different type bombs to use. Very generous with the lives. I felt like it gave me a lot of room to die over and over and over in number, again in number two and number one it didn't number one you died twice you got to continue you died twice again it was game over like you literally had four deaths that seems standard so the second yeah. one was super generous yeah second one i think you could die like 
three or four times, then you got to continue, die three or four more times, get to continue, and then die three or four more times. Like, it, w- it was pretty crazy. Um, I'm right there with you, man. The graphics were good. I felt that the uh, speed of the game was very good. The enemies coming in were, like, just at the right time. It was a little more difficult than I would have anticipated. They always um, are. Yeah. Well, they always are. This one just seemed a little harder than most that I've played in the past. Um, and the music, I thought, was pretty sweet. Like that intro music to the actual game, and then obviously within the game, I, I thought it was really the differentiator for me compared to other, you know, shooters that I've played. Well, top down shooters. Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was a bunch of fun. It looked great, sounded great. But John, is it worth thirty six sixty seven loose or sixty one thirty one complete in your long box? Now I do have a long box copy complete. Um, that average that you gave on the complete 61, uh, that is, I'm not kidding you. I was looking earlier that is averaging from a $49 sold listing online to a $90 listing online within the last couple months. So it is all over the place. Uh, hence the 61 now loose $36. Uh, I mean, it no, was the a f- loose is 36. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 61. That's what I'm saying. Loose. I'm going to go on the loose. If you just wanted to pick this game up to play it uh, at $36, it might be a little too high for me. I think if I had this game on, you know, like an arcade setup, I'd probably and say, say I had an arcade setup and I had to pay $36 to get this installed on my arcade theoretically um i would pay 36 dollars now for a ps1 game 36 dollars probably not um but then again we didn't play two players either we only played one so you know i guess if you figured in well, the it's ability, gonna be the same it, it is but yeah. the enjoyment aspect of it i think is a little better because there's two people actively playing and, and working together so would you throw down 18 bucks if i was willing to throw down 18 bucks I think I'd throw down a total of $25 max with tax loose. Okay. That's where I would stick. And that would be both of us putting in 25 bucks to play. So you'd pay 50. No, I mean, sorry, not 20. That's combined 25. Yeah. Sorry. Math was off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So 25 bucks for the two of us to pitch in and say, let's play this game loose. I would do that. So I would say this game is slightly inflated, but it's still a fantastic game. Like if you can find it at, 25 to 30 bucks loose i would totally pick it up okay you know um i think that there's a lot of good shmups out there probably and this one is quite fun it felt very familiar i don't know if i've actually played this before or if it's just very reminiscent of something else i've played um i just i don't think that i would pay that much for it loose i think that I think that I would probably come closer if I was a collector to paying the 61 for a complete version than I would be to pay 36 for a loose. I think I, I would feel better about getting like a cool long box to add to my collection with a really good game inside of it. I would feel comfortable buying this as opposed to paying the same price for Days Gone or Anthem. Yeah, I could see that. Okay. So, uh, end of the day, though, do you see this game as inflation, deflation? Where are we going to agree on this? I think it's... I don't know. It's weird, because, like, like I seriously... I'm looking at the long box. It looks really nice. I did have a good time with it. I could see putting some time in to play this game. And, I mean, I would say that it's worth it if you are a fan of the genre... Or if it's something that you need to add to your collection that maybe you've been holding off on, if you could find it for a good price. Because like I'm looking at the sales listing here, and that 61 is like a pretty good average, but I do see some up here for like 80s and uh, some. Uh, here's one for 111, but I also see some for 50s. So I'm going to say 61 is probably inflated for me. I mean, I think that if you really want it, you could pay that because you could wind up paying more. I I don't know. It's tough. It's tough. I'm going to say inflated. I'm just going to say it's still inflated. It's good. 
It's worth it for a good price, but not not for what it says here. Now you ready for the price I paid for it? What'd you pay? Two ninety nine. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, that is one of my, uh, I think I picked up Brighton Project at the same time that I got Bomberman on the Saturn Bomberman and, uh, all of those are three bucks a piece at that time. So, you know, if you were a really good collector, John, you would have like, uh, a notebook with like all the price tags for all the games and written under each of them, the date and the location where you bought it. You know, now that stings because I really wish that I did something like that. Like, like um, the old man that has like. His black book of phone numbers. But well, this he's is... got like the book of like every time he put gas in his car, how much the gas prices were and I'd actually where kinda... he got that oil change in 1945. Uh, dude, that'd actually be pretty awesome. I kind of want to do that now. Just write down like where I got these games. And I can tell you, uh, most of my pickups, I actually have taken a photo of it beforehand and posted like, you know, what I paid and whatnot. So I could probably do that for a bulk of my collection. Um but some of them are just good memories. James and I have obviously talked about it before. Yeah, it's, your guys' ability to remember this stuff is crazy. Yeah, it's just good memories. You can see I peeled off a price tag on there, but I know I paid two ninety nine on that game. Uh, well, um, I think for next week, I'm just going to toss out a console here, and you can tell me yes or no. I'm thinking 3DO next week. I've never played one. Let's do it. All right, so I've got a few games down there. Um, I'll be up front. I've got a good... Probably... 15 like actual complete games when i bought the 3do the guy i bought it from gave me the entire 3do collection on like burn cds um but i do have like multiple games like physical copies of them as well so really up to you we'll be up front with whichever we select if we go through my actual hard copies or this giant bag of games that he gave me um so yeah i've, I've actually played it a few times it's a lot of fun and wait till you see the wonky controller set up for two people Awesome. Let's check it out. Yeah, we'll do it next week. All right. Well, uh, I think I'm good, man. I don't think we got anything else to talk about. So if you're good, I'm good. This yeah. has been John. And I'm Ryan. And we are the, the Game, Game Deflators. Deflators.